believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, you are going to heaven. And if you yeah. don't, no matter what you've done in your life, yeah. you ain't. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, there's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches, and from the Christian faith, this is what I believe. But I just think that only God can judge a person's heart. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father, and, uh, you know, I don't know all about their religion, but I know they love God, and I don't know. I, I don't know. Give us some men who know the truth. And who will stand with Athanasius and Polycarp and Calvin and Luther and Whitfield and Edwards and who will declare from the housetops that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's so important. You better know who you're listening to, my friend. You better be careful because we are living in perilous days right now. There is darkness on the horizon. I don't know the full measure of what it's going to look like. It could be worse than anything we've ever anticipated in our lifetime. For all we know, I don't know that for a certainty, but I do know that as Paul said to Timothy, perilous times have come. This is a difficult hour we're living in. And you and I had better be careful. It's no longer optional for you to play the religious lottery and hope it works out okay. You better know that who you're listening to is speaking for God. Make up your mind. Not one mention of God in that, not one mention of Jesus Christ in that. That's just my message. There is scripture in there that backs it all up, but I feel like, Byron, I'm called to help people. How do we walk out the Christian life? How do we live it? And these are principles that can help you. I mean, if there's a lot better people qualified to say, here's a book that's gonna explain the scriptures to you. I don't think that's my gift. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives Him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Let's open our hearts. Now, what opens the hearts of leaders to lies? Firstly, their hearts are open to it when they've, they have an unsurrendered inner longing for prestige and power. Matthew 23, 6, it says, they love the best seats at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. I had occasion several years ago to be in Washington. I was invited there by our former president before our present one to talk about uh, some social and charitable issues. And there were 60 pastors there. I was shocked at the behavior of many of these, not all, but many of these men of God. Their behavior was shocking. The disregard of authority, any authority but their own. I remember going into the White House, getting a special tour, and the agent speaking on behalf of the president said, please, because we're in a time of difficulty in our nation, we would appreciate no pictures. As soon as the agents left, they were lining up to take pictures of one another. Absolute disobedience to authority. Fought for the front seats when the president came in and I watched pastors literally push women out of the way to get closer to the president. It was embarrassing to be there. I was embarrassed, honestly, to be associated with some that were in this group seemingly representing the biggest ministries in the country. So we talk about that. You know, that's the principle I teach, that find your passion in life and figure out a way to make money. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now can... Say that again, because I they now, don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is 
is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a Son of he's God. He's the first fruit. If you've, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Okay. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. Until I learned I, the third place that Jesus shed his blood to break the curse of poverty. And, and I want to hit that because poverty is a curse. It is a, a curse. curse. Absolutely. You know, and, and people have to understand Savior. this so much. And the curse of poverty has been broken and we're reconnected to Jehovah, our, our Jireh, our provider, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, see, now this is so vital here, Pastor Larry. I, I can go forever, and we're going to have to take a break and come right back. But that's why it says, He became poor that you might become come rich. The hearts are open to lies when there's an inner longing for prestige and power. The hearts are open to lies when they love and need the praise and admiration of men. Jesus said of the false religionists in his day in Matthew 23, 7, they love greetings in the marketplaces and they love to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher. They love it. Folks, you better hope that I love God more than I love you. I speak that for all the pastors of this church because if I love you more than I love God, my heart will be open to something of deception. I have to be willing to challenge you. I have to be willing to do it lovingly. I have to be willing to stand here. When even my own flesh doesn't want to do it, I have to be willing in obedience to God because I'm not fighting for your admiration. I'm fighting for your soul. I'm fighting for your families, I'm fighting for your future. You might get mad at me and walk out today and say, I'm never going back there. But as long as I see you at the gate of heaven when I get there, I'm happy about that. Thank God for that. <laughs> Preachers' hearts are open to lies when they're not called of God. We're living in a generation like that. I spoke at a pastor's conference a few years ago and God gave me an unusual message. And I spoke to the pastors who were dried, disillusioned, disaffected, have never heard from God, don't get a living word. And I said, many of you got into ministry because it was a good idea. It was in a peace time. And when you graduated from school, it was all just what Bible college are you going to? And when you graduated from Bible college, it was what church are you going to pastor? And you never really thought about whether or not you're actually called of God. It was just a good idea and you went. But you don't get a word, you don't get a message, you're constantly frustrated. I said, for the sake of the kingdom of God, have the courage to admit that you're not called of God, if you aren't. It was the most unusual pastor's message I'd ever preached in my lifetime. But I gave an altar call and it was filled with weeping men. Many of whom in their hearts were saying, finally somebody said it, what I've been thinking all along, I think I've missed it. I think I took a wrong turn somewhere. It was a good idea, but it wasn't God's idea. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 21 and 22, God said to the prophet, I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I've not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, if they had caused my people to hear my words, they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil of their doings. If they had stood in my presence, they would have challenged every behavior that was taking them away from the life that is promised, not just eternally, but on earth. That abundant life that Jesus Christ spoke about. Preachers lie when people want them to. That John saw in the book of Revelation a multitude, no man could number, of every tongue, of every nation, of every tribe, which no man could number, but nothing is said of that in terms of those who go to hell. It seems like there are more going to heaven. Whoa, hallelujah! And I think this church, this ministry has a lot to do with that. Oh, 
anointing. You put something up here. Woo! Put this anointing on it. I'll put this anointing on it. I'll tell you what, you put something up here. I'm putting put this anointing on this money, man. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. The prophet says an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. That means that they're leading in the flesh. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? In other words, what will you do when the battle comes and God is not with you? What will you do when the days get dark and you don't have light, oil in your lamp, you don't have light to stand? I warn every preacher that ever steps in this pulpit, every guest speaker we have, do not be drawn by the applause of the people. If you let yourself be drawn, you'll end up preaching exactly what they want you to. Now, thank God, I'm not suggesting you don't take moments when messages are preached and agree, but a preacher must not ever be drawn by the praise or the applause of man, or we will all end up preaching exactly what you want to hear. Preachers lie when they live to preserve themselves. And I was encouraged and on fire for the Lord and feel, felt a call to be a Presbyterian pastor. And I also knew that I was gay. And that's a paradox if ever there was one. And I had to figure it out. I went to Woody's. <laughs> the flagship gay bar of the neighborhood in Philadelphia. And it was line dancing night. Like I said, it was a camp experience. Marriage is a gift that God gives to humanity, but God gives it to all people, not just a certain sect or a certain religion. It is a gift for all. And so the church must make sure that we are not getting between gifts that God is giving to the people. The church should not be someone who denies a blessing to anyone. This context in this world 2,000, 3,000 years ago is so entirely different from our own that to compare it to our society now and people in same gender relationships makes absolutely no sense. Walk alongside you, LGBTQ Christians, we are here because we have seen the world transformed by love and we are working towards a profound future that we would love to partner with you with. Jesus said in John 10, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, one who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Sheep are just cordwood to be counted. The sheep are just something so he can go to a conference and say, I want to tell you how big my church is. That's all the sheep are to many, the people of God. Pastors must never live to preserve themselves. You pray that God help us. You pray if you're visiting today, God help your pastor. If you're listening online, not to live to preserve himself or herself. Pastors lie when they live secretly defeated lives. They can't see a way out and they begin to preach peace, compassion, inclusion, tolerance to make their own inner defeat more acceptable. John, Jeremiah 6, 14 says, they say peace, peace when there is no peace. Matthew 5, 15, 14, Jesus calls them blind guides and they lead both themselves and those who follow them into a ditch. I want to encourage any pastors that might be listening to me. There is victory for you. There's victory for you in your private life. There's victory for you in that place that nobody else sees, even in your despair and discouragement, depression, whatever it is you struggle with. There's victory for you. Don't live a defeated life because if you do, you'll end up preaching that defeat to others and beginning to pretend it's victory. Now contrast this to the New Testament. Paul, the apostle, was a genuine shepherd of God. I want you to listen to his words. Remember he told the New Testament church, I love you, though it seems the more I love you, the less I be loved. He had a heart for God's people and every true ambassador of Christ has that heart in them. 
a heart for you, a heart to see you stand, a heart to see you grow, a heart to see you become everything that God's destined you to be, a heart to see you free from captivity, free from besetting sin, free from despair, free from fears about the future, free from the constant grinding of the past and the lies of the devil telling you you'll never amount to anything. True pastor of God has a heart to see you free because Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We're to be a free people. I've never been willing to pretend that I'm free. I've never been willing to play a game in my own life. You either are free or you aren't. We don't have to pretend a game and play with God. Thank God the cross did buy our freedom. The blood of Jesus Christ did defeat our enemies. Now Paul is speaking to the Corinthian believers in the context of people I'm going to read a scripture to you, but he's speaking in the context of those who believe that they can have heaven and continue in certain behaviors, certain lifestyles, certain ways of thinking. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. In other words, if you continue in certain practices, heaven is not your home, no matter what preacher tells you it is. And there will be all kinds of compromise in this generation. Pastors are going to buckle under the pressures of this time. And as Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue is raised and the music begins to play, they will bend their knee to it. They will redefine holiness. They will redefine salvation. You better be careful who you're listening to. Paul said, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sexual relationships outside of the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman. That's fornication. So make up your mind. You either stop fornicating or get married. Make up your mind, folks. Some are sitting here today say, wow, man, he's tough on us this morning. You have to understand, I bear responsibility for you before God. I stand before God today, and I answer for every one of your faces here this morning. I answer for you. There's a list going to be presented to me, and I will have to answer for you. What did you do under the word that God gave me? How did I present Christ to you? Was I honest with you? Did I encourage you to walk with God? Did I present a full balance before you so you would actually see the benefit of walking away from sin and walking into the life that God has for you? Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals. And that talks about the practicing homosexual. Nor sodomites, nor thieves, that's male prostitutes. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, Paul says. Don't let any preacher deceive you. Don't let anybody stand there with horns of iron saying it's going to be well, go and prosper. Don't let them deceive you. I have a vision for the future of the church, and I want to share with you what it is. This is my partner, Eric, and I. And someday, Eric is going to be my husband, and I'm going to be a pastor of a church, and a kid's gonna walk in who's gay. And he's gonna have all these questions and he's not gonna know what to do, but there are a couple of things that he's gonna know that I didn't. The first thing he's gonna know is that God does not mean for us to be alone. And God does not mean for that child to be alone. And the other thing he's going to know, deep in his bones, is that there is a community, a church, that loves him and cares about him and will defend him and teach him there is a church full of love and justice for all of God's people. Then Paul goes on and says, and such were some of you, but now you're washed, now you are sanctified. It means you're given the power of God's Holy Spirit to be the person that God designed you to be. Now you've been given power. Now you're justified. In other words, yes, you will fall. Yes, you will fail. But the true believer in Christ wants to live 
that full measure that God has revealed to them through the scriptures. And when you fall, you're justified because your heart is right before God. You say, God, forgive me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to speak this way. I don't want to think this way. And while you are fighting that fight, the Bible declares you justified, covered, covered in your failure, covered in your struggle because you know and God knows you're not playing a game. You are moving towards walking in the truth of God. And you're sanctified all your life. You're going to be changing from image to image and glory to glory, even as by the spirit of God. Yes, you have struggles today, but those struggles in your life will start losing their power. Their fuel source was put to death at the cross of Jesus Christ and you will begin to change. So don't lose heart in this battle and don't start listening to somebody that tries to tell you, oh no, just go ahead, live this way. Everything's going to be fine when you get to the end. All races, obviously, in your, your, your church, we see all people, all races. I can't imagine that you would have 16,000 people in there and that none of them would be gay. So are gay people also included? Absolutely, anybody is. You know, you know, Oprah, we sometimes make a, I say we, maybe the Christian community makes a bigger deal out of gay, out of being gay, but. Will a gay person be accepted into heaven? as you see it? Well, I believe they will, mm -hmm. because I believe that, uh, you know, if we, you have to have forgiveness for your sins, but you know, sometimes we look at gay being, you know, a bigger sin than being proud or being, you know, not telling the truth. I don't think God categorizes sins. I think we're all changing and, you know, I'd love to think that we're all going to be without one sin. I hope that's true, but I don't think, I don't think any of us would make it to heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, I would encourage people to be willing to, to change and grow, and if, you know, if you've got a problem with your temper, let's, let's keep growing, and, but I think that it's going to be open for all of us or we wouldn't have a chance. You know, take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God, Allah, to a Muslim, to us, Abba Father, God, and of course, through history, those views have changed greatly. Uh, it talks about one of the points it brings out is one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live That's and right. that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world that there are millions of ways to be a then human being and, and many ways no but many paths many to what you call god that and her crazy. path might be something else and when she gets there she might call it the light but her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? There is one way and only one way, and there that is through be. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million of people say in the world. There, there couldn't possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If no. you don't believe that, you're all buying into the lie. See, I'm not a true shepherd if I let you continue in sin that will ultimately destroy your soul. It doesn't matter how I can sing, it doesn't matter how nice I might look or not look. None of it matters. If I let you continue in sin and you end up in hell, I'm not a shepherd. Remember one time when we had sheep back on the farm in Canada, my wife loves to tell this story, but she came in the barn one day and I had a knife out and I was sharpening it and, and I was cutting the nose of a sheep open. And she looked at me and said, why are you doing that? Poor sheep is on its sitting on its uh, haunches and looking at me and they're so trusting and I'm cutting its nose open with a very, very sharp knife and uh, antiseptic and I said, because there's a bug that's gotten under the skin of its nose, there's a spe specific name for this bug and if I don't cut it out, it multiplies, goes into the, uh, in, under the skin, into the uh, sinuses and things and eventually will drive the sheep mad. It will start running full speed into walls and it will ultimately kill itself, be driven insane. And it looks so small, it's only one bug. It's only one little thing. You know, a false shepherd wouldn't care. I'll just leave it there. I got 99 more. What difference does it make if this one goes crazy? 
And trust me, they don't appreciate it when you're cutting their nose open. <laughs> that poor sheep was looking at me askance for a long, long time. Not only cut it open, I had to sew it up. And that poor sheep is avoiding me and running to the sides of the barn, not knowing I just saved her life. It's not really what she wanted. Why can't you just leave me alone? It's only a little bug. Why did you have to come at it so powerfully? Some are saying here this morning, why, why are you speaking so hard? I, I only slip once in a while. It's like a man who comes out his door in the wintertime and falls on his walkway almost every day. And his neighbor says, well, why don't you put salt on the ice? He said, well, no, I just enjoy the slip every once in a while. And some people are like that. They just enjoy the slip and then come back in and say, well, God, you know, I'm only human. And if pastors like me get up and challenge their behavior, then they go out to somewhere where their behavior is not challenged. With pastor enjoy the slip in the pulpit in the morning. Paul stood on the deck of a perishing ship in journey in Acts chapter 27 and told the people, take some meat. Up to this point, you've not eaten what you should, and you're going to need strength for the future. He knew the ship was going to fall apart. He knew everybody was going to be cast into the sea, and he knew it was going to be a long, arduous swim to shore. And he knew that when they got to shore, it was going to be a land they were not familiar with. And so he told them, take some meat. And I'm telling you this morning, it's not time for pablum, it's time for meat. It's time that we embrace the truth, we love the truth, we receive the truth, it might be palatable to go to certain places, listen to certain messages, but it's not going to get you through the coming storm. When you need strength, it's not going to be there. When you want guidance, you're going to have forfeited it. No, take some meat. It will strengthen you. It will strengthen your family. Don't run from the truth. Remember Paul said to those who were pretending that they were off doing something, but they were actually going to try to escape. He said, if you don't stay with the ship, you're not going to survive. Stay with truth, don't run from truth. Especially the men that are here, it's Father's Day today, for the sake of God, for the sake of your family, stand up and be a man. Don't run from truth. Run towards the truth and run towards it with all of your heart. Embrace the truth in your own heart. Don't try to teach others until you've embraced it yourself. Trust God for your own transformation. Trust God for the compassion, the wisdom, the ability you need to lead your family, whether your children are still under your roof or whether they live a thousand miles away. You still have influence. Trust God and make the decision to be a man of God. Make the decision to stand up and be counted with those that have stood for Christ all of these years and have never known him to fail them. Don't run from the hard things. Don't run from those areas where God is challenging your life and telling you it's going to be a difficult journey, but you're going to need strength. So take some meat now. It's time for you to take some meat. John chapter three, Jesus himself talks about an invitation that God gives to come to the light. You don't have to run from God. God didn't come into the world to condemn you. He came into the world that you might be saved through him. He came to get you. He came to cover you. He came to strengthen you. He came to envision you. He came to empower you. He came to give you a new song and a new heart and a new mind. He came to raise you up as a light set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. First in your home, second in your marriage, thirdly in this generation. He came to give you strength not found in anything of this world. So come to the light. Don't be afraid of the light. Don't be afraid of letting this book examine your heart. It's not pleasant sometimes. We all want to think that we're all doing better than we are. Thank God for the knowledge that I'm covered in Christ. So I'm not afraid to go in. I'm not afraid of meat. I'm not afraid of truth. I'm not afraid to have God challenge my heart. <laughs> Forgive me for being where I shouldn't be. Forgive me for doing what I shouldn't do. Forgive me for being paired up with a man I should have left a long time ago a partner that I should have walked away from. Forgive me, God, for listening to these voices that claim to speak in your name, that allowed me to continue in a place where I was 
strictly in the flesh. And is cut off from where true strength is. God, please forgive me and strengthen me that I might live to fight another day. Head to the cross. There's no victory anywhere else now. There's no strength anywhere else but in the victory of Christ. But I warn you, there's no strength in mixture. I don't care how much scripture you know. There's no strength in mixture. Pray for that in your heart. Say, God, please get me away from voices I shouldn't be listening to. And put me in a place where I can listen, where I can hear, where I can grow in grace, where I can be made strong in Christ, where I can know the truth of God that sets me free, where I can be used of you, God, for the sake of others in the days ahead. God, put me in that place. As your pastor, I've pleaded with you today. I have pleaded with you. As Paul the Apostle said before his death, I want it recorded that I'm free from the blood of all men. I've declared to you as best as I know the full counsel of God in this service today. And I plead with you in Christ's name, walk with God. Walk with where God is. Walk under a word that's from God. If you can't find a word from God, those that are online, then get it yourself. Open this book and read from the Gospel of Matthew to Revelation. Go back and read it again, read it again, read it again, and read it again. God will show you.